All right. Welcome, to, welcome, friends, to this episode of the Sync Your Life podcast. Today, I'm joined by my friend, Dr. Paige Gutile. We're going to dive into all things women's health today, and I'm super excited because she is a primary care practitioner who is really quite different from your average primary care practitioner. We're going to be talking about things like women's hormone health. We're going to be talking about cycle syncing, which totally helps me nerd out in the space that I love to discuss. So we have lots of things to cover today. She gave me several topics that she's willing to discuss. And if you guys know, I want to take advantage of every piece of knowledge and wisdom that she has to share. So without further ado, Dr. Page, welcome to the show. I'll have you just sort of kick things off for us with just a brief background of your story and who you are and what led you to doing what you do. Yeah, awesome. So great to chat with you. So yes, I'm Dr. Page, as most people call me, I'm an osteopathic family practitioner by training. So in a lot of ways, I was brought up in the medical community, having a very holistic view of health, and then honestly got kind of sucked into the traditional healthcare system and the traditional training system, where health tends to be very fragmented. So I practiced in a very traditional private family practice for almost 15 years and started teaching at our local medical school here in Columbus, Ohio. And as the years gone on, I just found myself coming more and more back to the holistic view of health that I learned very early in my training and dove head first into more integrative health and functional medicine training. And eventually went from my very busy fragmented private practice into developing um, Signature Primary Care and Wellness, which is a membership-based practice where we provide comprehensive primary care, but also really lean into the wellness um, support that people need to make real life changes because what I found and what you may have experienced out there You can go to your doctor and even if your doctor is wonderful, which is kind of hard to find a doctor that like sits down with you for a half hour, an hour, and hears everything that's going on and and, and counsels you and you come up with a great plan, but then you have to go back to your life. (laughs) And so we need that support every single day. And so that's what I love most is uh, developing programs with patients where we actually can check in and have community and support for making those small layered longitudinal micro changes. Uh, We call them messy micro changes. Like we're just trying to improve a little bit every day out here. And um, that's what really moves the ball. Yeah, I love that you said that. The, um, the, The practitioner that I've been seeing for the last few years, who's really been instrumental for me in my, in my hormone health, um, has, you know, their actual facility where I go to see her, it has a kitchen and they do like cooking classes, like nutritional classes. Like they're really trying to implement sort of the lifestyle piece for people. I so think this is what we need. And I do believe that, that integrative medicine, um, getting to root cause for people and helping people really understand their unique deficiencies or whatever's happening for them is on the rise, because I think people are getting sick of what some people call our sick care system. I just did an interview with Dr. Calvin Ng where he said, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system, right? And so I love that you're doing this and I I can kind of see already what makes you different, right? Because you are taking that sort of whole life approach. I'd love for you to just speak briefly on that subject, right? I think most people, especially women that come to me, I know are very used to the traditional medical scene. They're used to Mm -hmm. having an OBGYN. They're used to having maybe specialists, right? And people that sort of look at their segmented pieces of their body, so to speak. Um, And a lot of women are told everything is normal, right? They do lab work or they do these things and they're told, oh, no, you're you're not crazy, but you know, this, this is just normal. It's part of your life. This is what you're going through. And I want to speak specifically to that woman as we go through this podcast episode. But for now, I want to talk about what, what are most people experiencing in the medical world and, you know, what sets you apart? Like, what do you think integrative practitioners are doing differently? Really good question. So, and there's a a lot in there, honestly, I quite frequently am asked like, so what kind of things do you treat? And, you know, from a primary care perspective, and I really try to bring together, um, because sometimes we can be so polarized, right? Like the, so I really try to bring together kind of the best of traditional science because we can be unapologetic about using really good, safe science and the best of the most natural approaches. 
And that's where I feel like the sweet spot is. And so in my practice, I tend to see, everybody would ask me, you know, what kind of things do you treat? And I'm thinking, gosh, everything, right? Like primary care doctors are trained in a broad array of things and to a great degree, kind of to be the quarterback of your health, to see the big picture and connect with specialists when we need to dive deeper. But honestly, when we have the time and interest in keeping our scope of practice broad, primary care doctors can treat a lot. And so as I reflected though on like, so, you know, what, what are the most common things that I see? It's exactly what you hit on. It is a group of people, um, my practice, you know, I see birth till death, males and females, but the, the, the peak, if we have to look at that bell curve is kind of your forties, fifties, um, woman who is stressed, tired, overwhelmed, overweight, and generally just feeling older than she should. And I, you know, kind of half laugh because we hear all these acronyms in medicine, like the pharmaceutical industry kind of makes up some acronyms. And so I'm like, that's, that's my acronym, <laughs> you know, stress, tired, overwhelmed, overweight, and feeling older than, than you should, studious, something like that. Um, and so that woman oftentimes has been told everything is normal and everything is not normal unless you feel like you are thriving and you are on the path to reaching your personal best. And that I think is really key. We don't have to be perfect to feel good, right? If we are on a weight loss journey, for example, and if I have 50 pounds to lose, I don't start feeling better once I reach my goal weight. I start feeling better when I start feeling good about myself, primarily when I develop the belief that I am empowered to make health changes. And when I actually start eating better and moving my body and sleeping, which is probably the biggest key, as you know, um, and so really it's just getting women on that path to looking broader and saying, I'm not trying to be not sick. I'm actually trying to optimize my health. And that's where the semantics go awry. I think with a lot of traditional doctors, they can tell you, oh, you're not sick, but there's a, there's a big spectrum in between not sick and thriving. Yes. Okay. So it's total, we're totally stepping up onto the soapbox at this point, um, this early <laughs> on in the podcast, but I totally agree. I mean, the, the, yeah. The, the phrase that I say most often to my course takers is normal is not optimal. So if you're, if your check engine light is flashing, like if you feel like my energy is low, I can't keep up with my kids, right? Like I'm holding on to all the weight, like all these things that a lot of women experience, especially as they near 40 and beyond, it's, you know, to have your OBGYN or, or your, or your PCP say to you like, well, everything looks fine. Like this is just part of, I've, I've heard this so much. This is just part of aging, right? This is just part of perimenopause or whatever. Um, it's not okay. Like just because it yeah. happens doesn't mean that it's normal and normal is not optimal. And I, I have this happen all the time where women will step into my course and they'll say, oh, you know, my lab work all came back and everything was normal. And they put it in air quotes, you know, and I'm like, okay, well, did your doctor talk to you about what is optimal for you to be thriving, right? And so again, I know I'm repetitive on this podcast with saying this, but I wanna make sure that everybody that listens hears it. There's a range that's given for normal, right? And that range is determined by the broad pool of people who have the test done. <clears throat> so it doesn't necessarily mean that it's being, that the normal is not being weighed by healthy, thriving, high energy people. Like that would be a totally different ballpark number. So, um, so that's what I want people to understand. And so finding someone like you, finding someone who does maybe dig a little bit deeper, who, who understands that is so, so key. And it's so hard to find, like, it is seriously so hard to find because, um, I just, I just find that most traditional doctors are not trained in, in understanding that. So I want to yeah, talk about, my, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. My, my thing is, uh, common, not normal. So mm -hmm. most people come in and say like, is this normal? Is this normal? I'm like, super common, not normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't have yeah. to be normal. And, you know, we live in a society largely, you know, it varies by our particular towns or area of the country. But if we talk about our health culture as a whole in the United States in particular, and even the influences that we've had in other parts of the world, um, we are gradually adopting things that 
become more and more common, but just not normal, you know, and we, mm -hmm. you're right, we could get on the soapbox all day about this from our, you know, food supply system to our activity levels and our Netflix habits and our phones and, you know, what we expect from the aging process, what we expect from menopause, like the list goes on and on, but I just really encourage you to think about like, okay, just because I see it all around me doesn't mean it's normal. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing that's, that comes to my mind is um, how often women are are told that if their body is holding on to the weight, they should just go on some sort of diet. They should restrict carbs or they should consider something oh. like keto or whatever. And it's, I mean, I hear this all the time, right? Women will come in and they'll say, well, my doctor just told me I need to lose weight. I need to just restrict my calories. And I'm thinking, oh my God, oh my goodness. Right. Like if you are truly entering something like perimenopause, where your adrenals are starting to compensate more for your sex hormone hormone production and your, your cycles are changing and things are changing. The last thing you want to do is restrict your body of more calories. Right. And, uh, a lot of women will do what they used to do. They'll say, oh, well, I used to exercise five or six days a week. I need to get back to that. And it's like, well, that might not be what your body is requiring at this stage of life. So I think it, it's a combination yeah. of, of perhaps like a lack of understanding, but also just the wrong prescriptive lifestyle changes, right? Like telling a woman to cut back on her calories and exercise more in a phase of life where perhaps that's not going to serve her is just going to work against her and make her feel like she's going crazy. <laughs> yeah. I think so many times I think, oh man, aren't we past this? Like, isn't this like, so eighties, nineties, right. eat less, exercise more. And you know, I am such a big picture person. And honestly, I, I see both sides of it quite frequently coming from traditional healthcare and, you know, knowing kind of a doctor's mind, even well-meaning doctors, you know, are so hampered by the system of 15 minute office visits. And we, as a patient come in with, you know, a list of 10 things to go over for our copay, you know, we have to kind of meet in the middle and say like, okay, this system just is not serving us. And I need to get the support that I need probably, especially if you're going to function within the system, so to speak, um, it's going to come from multiple sources. It's going to come perhaps from a primary care doctor that's leading the charge, but also specialized dietitian, personal training, um, mental health, whatever, you know, the case may be where you want to start your deep dive, but specialized advice from people that are in alignment with your healthcare philosophy, you know? Mm -hmm. So, because I see, you know, a lot of patients come in and, you know, they're not at a point where they are seeking a more lifestyle oriented cure. They would love to find the magic pill and they're begging yeah. for the magic pill, you know? And so a lot of doctors kind of have been sucked into that, that path and you're right, aren't up to date on the, I mean, I can't even say it's the latest science. It's been around for quite a long time. Um, but aren't up to date on what, especially a um, life transition perimenopausal, for example, woman needs. And the healthcare system historically doesn't serve, the research doesn't serve women all that well. Right. Um, unfortunately, it costs a lot of money to do research on women where we have to count for phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, and I just recently, I mean, not all that recently, but it's amazing that even going through healthcare training, like I was not aware of all those kind of things to consider that, mm -hmm. oh, hey, this eat less, exercise more, or even some data on intermittent fasting, um, or, you know, small frequent meals <laughs> comes based one from years and years ago, and based on, you know, the 70 kilogram healthy young male. And it is just silly of us to think that we need to fit in that box. Yeah, I had an interview with a uh, functional doctor recently, and he was talking about how all through med school, um, everything that was taught was just the human body. And there was never the question of, well, what about the difference yeah. between the male and the female body, right? And what people don't understand sometimes is that, at least I know pertaining to exercise science, 90% <clears throat> or more of research has been done on men. So when we hear about yeah. the latest trend, right, periodization training or muscle confusion or endurance training or HIIT training, like all these different types of training that are quote unquote, the best way to lose weight or the best way to exercise. Just know that that research was done on men. 
And it's only been in the last decade or so that we've started to really, that researchers are investing the dollars and the time into understanding the women's, the female cycle and how that impacts everything. So yeah. You're totally right. And I, I think that, you know, I, I see this so much with women who want to start a ketogenic diet or they want to start intermittent fasting. And I just say to them, well, how's your menstrual cycle, right? Like let's factor that into the equation because any sort of change nutritionally can impact, of course, your, you know, your blood sugar, it can impact your, your menstrual cycle. Your body's going to prioritize survival <laughs> over reproduction. So, um, yeah. let's talk about that. And I, I'm not a fan personally of, of restricting anything. That's, I mean, of course, I, I am a fan of a lower carbohydrate diet um, when it comes to starch carbohydrates, but I'm, yeah. I'm a fan of women eating enough. And I find that most women aren't eating enough and they're not eating enough things like protein and healthy fats. And because of that, they're putting their blood sugar on a roller coaster and the blood sugar roller coaster then leads to hormone imbalance, which is where I want to go next is talking about hormonal health and how that pl really plays a role in how people feel, especially how women feel. Um, what do you see, you know, when women come in and they're complaining of things like their sleep is is awful, right? Or they're they're feeling extra stressed, or in a lot of cases, women wear a lot of hats, right? We're moms, we're wives, we're also maybe caring for our parents. You know, <laughs> we've got to do all the things plus attend the book club. You know, like so many things. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, we let everybody else kind of come ahead of ourselves, and then we wind up in that doctor's office, and we're like, oh, "Help me, doc!" Right? Because I am just out, like I am gassed. Yeah. What kinds of things are you seeing, and what role does hormones play in that? Yeah. So first I want to touch on something you mentioned just to kind of like grant us a lot of grace and that, you know, we are out there trying to solve our problems like the best we can. Right. And so it, our brain tells us like, okay, if what we're doing isn't working, I need to do more of it. Right. Like if what my, um, if my workouts aren't working, I must need to work out harder. If my restriction isn't working, I must need to restrict more. And what I hear you saying, I totally agree with is like, it's the exact opposite actually. And so um, the first step with patients oftentimes is kind of like taking a deep breath, granting that grace to say, we need to look at this differently. And we need almost universally, we need more wiggle room in our in our life. <laughs> we need more quiet time. We need less back to back to back. We need to take a deep breath. <laughs> um, and to no fault of our own, um, to some degree, like, yes, we do uh, have autonomy. We, we set ourselves up. We make these decisions. We've all probably been guilty of overscheduling and people pleasing and all the things, right? But just know that culture has an undercurrent of overstimulation. So if you are not consciously trying to kind of decrease stimulation and wring out the stress of the day, you are stressed. We, you don't think you're stressed because you cope so well with it. We're so good at it. We can hide it all day long, but the dings on the phone, the one ear out for the baby who might be, you know, waking up any minute, the part of our mind at work, part of our mind at our kid's school, or that we know our kid is with a trusted caregiver, but part of our mind is divided there. This mind division and overstimulation of screens and notifications and all of that is kind of, is just adding a layer to our sympathetic fight or flight, go, go, go side of the nervous system that has to be accounted for. So I honestly see very few people who are understimulated, <laughs> right? Um, most people find, feel like, oh no, I'm not stressed. I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. I'm keeping up with everything. And so they just don't realize that underneath the scenes, their sympathetic nervous system is on overdrive. And I, I do talk a lot about that division, even, even before hormonal health. Um, about nervous system governance, right? Like in some ways we can think of ourselves as a uh, you know, wonderful, sophisticated computer with lots of feelings and heart and intuition you know, mixed in there. And so those two sides of the nervous system, the kind of go, 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 fight or flight, and what some people call rest and digest, um, I call it the everything's okay side of the nervous system. Um, that everything's okay side of the nervous system in that, is the primary governance of 
hormone balance and immune system and recovery and um, longevity, cancer fighting, um, digestion, absorption of nutrients. Like that is our background reboot mode. And we just don't get into that side of the nervous system and nurture it quite enough. And so that oftentimes is primary um, and it's hard, you know, it's an everyday fight for that one. But that side of things, like that's influence on downstream hormones um, is so huge. Hormonal health, I mean, when we think of hormones as females, oftentimes, you know, we think of, um, I mean, we think of female hormones. It's kind of like analogous to like when we say carbs, we think of like breads and starches, but also we know that fruits and vegetables are carbohydrates and they're healthier carbohydrates. It's kind of like when we think of hormones, we think of just our female hormones, but hormones are simply signaling molecules, right? So there are digestive hormones, female hormones, you know, sex hormones, metabolism hormones, neurohormones. Um, and so they are absolutely, you know, like the bread and butter of how multiple systems work. I do find, and, and you might, um, might relate to this quite a bit. Um, sometimes we can overemphasize sex hormones, you know, it's always this balance, you know, and I do see a lot of patients come to me, like something must be up with my, you know, with my hormones. And I want to get my estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, FSH, all these, you know, hormones checked. And most of the time I have to kind of like pull in the reins a little bit because we have to think upstream, um, First, and there are some more foundational levers to our health that we have to make sure are optimized, kind of like what we were talking about before first. And so, um, and large to a large, and then everything kind of like regulates downstream, right? I oftentimes talk about um, like the bowling pins, right? I'm looking for those front bowling pins. Like if we can knock those over, boy, we're gonna get a strike, right? And hormones are kind of mid, like our sex hormones are kind of like mid or back bowling pins, right? We don't go tinkering with them quite a lot, but the front bowling pins actually that when we regulate those, which, I mean, we can go into more detail talking about this stuff, but those are the lifestyle factors, nutrition, fitness, sleep, stress management, vitamin D, thyroid function, you know, blood counts, all these things that, you know, we, we do have to like regulate those first. And then usually the sex hormones fall into place. Not always, but so I, on the one hand, I want women to be super aware of how their hormones work, how their natural cycles work, what to expect as normal and not normal. Um, but I also don't want us to like over obsess about like, oh, I need my estrogen to be in this range, you know, mm -hmm. or I need to be checking all these things because we can micromanage, you know, our health a little too much sometimes. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, I think it's interesting because I teach what's called the four fundamentals of hormone balance. Um, and we talk a lot about things like sleep and nutrition and exercise, right. And proper supplementation, perhaps things like vitamin D and, and yeah. things like that. Um, those are my four fundamentals, but what, what I think is interesting is you know, a lot of women will say like, please help me, please help me figure out something's off with my hormones. Right. And they're willing to shell out the money for hormone testing. They're willing to, you know, a lot of times, I mean, I just spoke with someone yesterday. It was like, I'm just going to do the birth control pill because she was just so fed up with the acne and the irregular cycles and the painful periods that she was like, my doctor wants to put me on this. And I'm finally just going to say yes. Cause I'm at wit's end. Right. That's not the answer um, necessarily. Right. I'm totally not, uh, not team birth control over here. But I just feel like, you know, we're so quick to like, please fix this because we know we feel off, right? Yeah. It comes back to that check engine light flashing. But it's funny too, because then you sit down with someone, the same person, and you ask them about their sleep and they say, oh, well, I don't sleep well, right? Like, or I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep, or I only average four to six hours of sleep a night, or I'm up at night with my little one or whatever. And sometimes are unwilling to then sort of biohack their sleep, right? Like, can you go to bed earlier? Ooh, I don't know. Like I really value my Netflix time, right? Like, or yeah. can you, can you shut off the blue light? Can you, um, take something like a magnesium, right? There, like there's so many different things that you, you start talking to somebody about 
And it's like, oh, but I have to do something lifestyle related. Like, I don't know. You know, I thought you were just going to kind of give me something to take or, or more exercise to do or something like that. Right. And so I would love for you to just touch on, you know, what are those front bowling pins? What are those things that by eliminating them, you know, and kind of making sure that they're on pace, make sure that all the bowling pins fall over and are, are, you know, that you're in a strike mode. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, lots of grace for that, right? Because we all know what it's like to feel so desperate that you're just like, let me just get something. (laughs) We just want something quick. Um, And we just kind of have to fight against that to say like, okay, there are, when it comes to our health, there are no quick and easy answers. Um, I often say that if the answer is quick and easy, um, or if the answer is quick and obvious, I should say, usually it's something you don't want. <laughs> like it's a bone sticking out of your skin or it's an appendicitis or, you know, it's something big, but for these, what happens with things like hormonal health and immune system function, autoimmunity, and, you know, our metabolism, there are a lot of gradual missed signals or things that get out of balance that are eventually reach their tipping point to the point where we notice something wrong. And so at that, you know, in those situations, we really just have to say, okay, let me take a deep breath. I don't, it's not up to me to set an artificial timeline of how my body should be healing. Like, oh, I need to have a 28 day cycle with four days of moderate flow And if that hasn't happened by month three, then uh, it didn't work or I didn't lose 10 pounds in one month. So this program isn't working. You know, there is no finish line to life anytime soon, hopefully. Right. I mean, we, so we have to kind of say, okay, let's, let's, as much as we want to get to some arbitrary goal, let's just get on the path and let's make those small gradual changes and let's really not be shy about feeling really proud of ourselves for the only thing that has been shown to work in behavior change, which is extremely messy micro changes layered upon themselves (laughs) and learning how to reroute when we get off track. I don't even really like that term off track so much because I mean, again, like we're living life, what track are we meant to be on? Um, But I often tell my patients like, my goal for you is not to be perfect. My goal is for you to reroute as quickly as possible, you know, and just to listen to your body, learn about your body and, you know, make, make the change. So um, to your point, like what are those front bowling pins? They really are a lot of the things that you talked about. If I had to pick one, so I, all the time I say like, if I had to pick one thing and then I'm like, Ooh, it's hard to pick one thing. <laughs> but if I had to pick one thing, sleep is the front bowling pin. Sleep is healing time, it's restoration time, it's hormone balancing time. If we are not getting adequate restful sleep, our expectations are just out of alignment with what we should be expecting our body to do. And yes, there are absolute like seasons in life, new baby season, (laughs) you know, for for families where adequate sleep is not going to be a um, bowling pin that can be knocked down, but it can always be improved. It can always be optimized. You know, we have a personal best at every stage of life. And to your point, like we do have to challenge ourselves, like, hmm, why, why can't I go to bed a little bit earlier? Well, so-and-so needs this or so-and-so, you know, needs that is, you know, what it boils down to sometimes. Okay. Well, what can I delegate? What can I do less of? Or, oh, I want my Netflix time. Okay, that's totally valid. Like we deserve to have alone time and we deserve to have pleasure in our lives. How can we, for lack of better term, eat, have our cake and eat it too, right? Um, How can we honor that, honor our needs, but also protect, you know, seven hours of sleep? And so sometimes that's rewinding bedtime for the kids. Sometimes it's getting up earlier, um, to have alone time in the morning. Sometimes it's taking a break during the day. That's what I find, um, myself trying to, um, encourage patients to do probably the most. Oftentimes we're like shot out of bed in the morning, then we're go, 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 reaching a hundred miles an hour. 
And then we expect ourselves to like, go, 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 fall asleep. Like not going to happen. Right. So if we're go, 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 and then we can take even 10 minutes to like reset midday. Okay. Now we have a little bit of reset. We're not all wound up at the end of the night and we can actually have a reasonable restful bedtime routine and, um, and get a better night's sleep. Yeah. I had a, a friend of mine, a physical therapist years ago, who, uh, when I was struggling with my chronic migraine issues, they sent me to physical therapy for my neck and, and all kinds of things. And he was a pivotal person for me because he talked to me about sleep. Uh, he was the first person to actually embrace. I had seen probably 14 different specialists and neurologists, and he was the first person to talk to me about lifestyle. <laughs> uh, and he said to me, he, he made the analogy that, you know, your body is like a computer. And what happens if you leave your computer open, right? If you leave that laptop open over time, what happens and you don't shut it down and reboot? It frazzles out, right? Things stop working. Um, you have to buy a new computer, right? Unfortunately, we can't buy a new body. So our body yeah. has to have that reboot. It has to, your brain, especially I have a blog post on this about the brain needs a reboot every single night. It needs deep sleep. It needs REM sleep. Um, so I agree, yeah, totally I agree with you. Say I, it's like, it's like the cleaners come out at night and like they're, they're just right. active cleaning up everything. And it's like, man, if you never, if you never give, give, uh, the cleaning crew a chance to do their, do their magic. Ugh, yeah. What are we left with over time? Yeah. A mess. Yeah. Uh, my husband and I invested in the aura ring, uh, this year. Oh, and I love so, it. I have one too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I always tell my, my clients too, I'm like, that people ask me all the time, like, how do you stay motivated? How do you stay motivated to exercise and lift weights? How do you stay motivated to prioritize your sleep? How do you stay motivated to eat healthier foods? And, and I'm not perfect by any means, nor do I advocate that, right? It's all, like you said, there's no such thing as a track. Like, it's just, we're all on this track of life and we figure it out. But for me, like it's, I can't not be motivated because once you know what you know, you can't unlearn it. Right. And so what I try to do is instead of telling people what to do, I tell them why they're doing it. Right. And so for, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, man, my sleep is pretty terrible. Like it probably should be a priority for me. I will tell you that for the last five years, I've said that to myself, I've told myself I need to go to bed earlier and I knew it. I knew what I needed to do, but then implementing what I needed to do was the hard part. And so just the simple education of this ring, like wearing this ring every single night and seeing, Ooh, I really went to bed too late last night. I didn't get enough deep sleep or man, it's really impacted my recovery from my exercise. So now it's affecting the way that I see results because now my exercise is worthless if I'm not sleeping. Right. So you start to see these things and you can't unknow them. So then you're yeah. like, well, now I'm motivated to make this a priority for myself. Right. Which yeah. leads me to something else, which is, um, I have interviewed Elise Wagner here on the podcast. She has, uh, created a program with the Institute for functional medicine. It's a health coaching program. That's very mm -hmm. new. Um, basically just equipping functional medicine providers with a lifestyle coach that can then work with a patient and help them implement the lifestyle changes into their life. And it made me think back to, um, a trusted mentor of mine who years ago said at some point in the near future, in the next decade, everybody will have a health coach. Everybody yeah. will have a health coach because doctors, you know, doctors are sort of in charge of like diagnosing and prescribing and, and help you under helping you understand things like root cause and but they can't walk with you necessarily along that journey, right? If they're seeing multiple patients and it, it, it's, it becomes an issue. So, you know, to me, it makes total sense. Like people are willing to hire um, experts in so many other areas. They want their kid to be the best at football. So they hire a, a private football coach, right? It's like, well, if you want to be better in your health, like work with a health coach, you need that accountability and support to really help make these, these lifestyle changes happen. I want to make yeah, sure that we I have, think yeah, go ahead. I think I, um, and I'm a little bit of an odd breed in that way, in that um, I almost relate less to my doctor hat uh, because I've redefined it so much. I, the best thing that people can tell me after they, we've chatted is like, oh, I feel like I just saw my therapist, <laughs> you know, because they don't relate to coach, but um, it's, uh, if doc thera coach was like a term, that would be my profession. Like I really <laughs> get into the, and, and, you know, taken additional training and coaching and, and counseling and things. And I think, you know, health coaching and life coaching, um, I have to joke with my patients. Like if, if I were president, like what I would mandate is therapy, <laughs> therapy and coaching. Like we all need it. We all need those people that can, um, walk beside us. And that's what I've seen change my community's lives the most is when we have implemented health coaches and have group coaching and one-on-one -on -one coaching and counseling where 
people can have that individual attention to set their health goals. You know, Mm -hmm. we all sometimes get tricked into thinking that like someone else needs to tell us what to do. I love to empower patients to choose their own adventure. You know, working out can look five gazillion different ways. A healthy Mm -hmm. diet can look five gazillion different ways. Stress management can look (laughs) so many different ways, but how do we gain that wisdom and knowing what our body needs and that um, support and accountability to keep taking step after step? So yeah, health coaches for everyone. Amen to that. Yeah. I want to make sure that we have enough time to, to dig into, you know, women's hormones specifically and mm-hmm. menstrual cycles. I know that we both share uh, enthusiasm over the topic of cycle syncing and helping women better understand what I like to call the highs and lows or the, the energy ebbs and flows of their cycle and how they can really utilize that um, for their life, right? Like not just with perhaps exercise, but also um, in their productivity and in their relationships. This is something that, I mean, my course is called sync. I mean, for a reason, it's all about cycle syncing, helping people understand their energy. Um, It's even game changing for men. It's game changing. I mean, I'm going to have my husband actually on the podcast. I've talked him into coming onto the podcast in January. It's totally not his personality, but um, he's learned so much about just what I'm experiencing over the course of a month. And so he better understands me, right? We have two daughters. So I have no doubt that that will come in useful. (laughs) Oh boy, Uh, So much more in the future, but um. So I want to talk about that. So let's let's just start with like, what do you wish that more people, more women, especially, knew about the role of female hormone cycles and how they can really leverage their energy um, at different phases of their cycle? Oh yes. So uh, what first sticks out to me about this is I all I sometimes laugh at myself because I have these various lenses, right? Like I have a traditional doctor lens, I have a real kind of expanded integrative functional health doctor lens. And then we all have a human lens, right? And some, we've all heard it like nurses and doctors are not the best patients sometimes because you don't have that, you just don't see it in yourself. And so the first thing that sticks out at me is like, I get it, you know, even though from a a doctor perspective, we know that these um, ebbs and flows are meant to happen. We know that some variation is meant to happen, um, especially in the um, early um, menstruating years and then the later um, menstruating years and a lot of ways menopause is the opposite of puberty right like puberty we're kind of getting our act together to have regular menstrual cycles menopause we're kind of easing out of the menstrual cycle um, so I get the point that you know there's kind of like the normal and then there's the common and then you personally when you experience maybe some irritability or disconnection from your, um, from your partner in the week before your period, you're like, what is going on here? (laughs) Or the first time that you have a, you know, menstrual cycle, 21 days after your last one, you're like, give me all the testing, what's going on here. And so what I've experienced personally is, you know, even those ups and downs, you know, as a woman and that when I kind of make myself pause, which is hard, right? But make myself reflect, okay, let me let me put on my detective hat. Let me put on my curiosity. You know, what's going on here? Usually like, again, it's not one thing. Usually a few things come to mind. Like, okay, I'm in my luteal phase. I'm expecting my cycle, you know, soon. Um, I didn't sleep well for the last two nights in a row, you know, a kid forgot to tell me about their project to the last minute. So we have added, you know, stressors and, you know, I was really carb happy the last couple of days. I'm like, okay, check, 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 any check. This is, this is what's going on with me. And again, like, I feel like I keep coming back to that word of grace. It's like that explanation can just give us the, um, give us the reassurance that like, we're normal, right? Like fluctuation is normal. Growth is normal. Like movement is, is, is normal. And there's nothing like more true than in the menstrual cycle. A lot of people like, you know, think of the menstrual cycle. Sometimes it's easy to chunk into like two uh, phases almost. Technically there's four phases, but some people tend to think like, okay, I got two weeks like this and I got two weeks like that. And if that's your first, like, 
step into trying to relate to your cycle, I think that's still super helpful. Um, but to me, what I wish people, more women knew is that just like I said, fluctuation is normal. Um, fluctuation in energy, fluctuation in motivation, fluctuation in um, wanting to connect with people like bonding, um, communication style versus like, I don't want to be bothered. And that all has a really hormonal, evolutionarily helpful explanation behind it. Um, and so when you are listening to your body and giving your body what it needs, sometimes that's, that is eating more carbohydrates. Sometimes it's understanding that in the week before our cycle, we're, if we look at our um, hunger levels, if we're eating intuitively in the week before our cycle, we're not going to eat 25% of our calories for the month. We might eat 35 or 40% of our calories for the month. And it's all going to iron out because our hunger levels are lower at other periods of the cycle. Um, we may find ourselves not being able to concentrate on detail oriented activities at certain point of our phases, but then, you know, at some point we're going to feel like a curtain's lifted and we can like really buckle down and knock through the work. And so just having that, I guess, confidence and reassurance that in a month's time, everything shakes out and everything irons out. Yeah. The one thing that I hear the most from women, um, when they become more hormone literate about their, mm -hmm. their bodies and their menstrual cycles, <clears throat> that's sometimes how I like to simplify what I do. I'm like, I help women become more hormone literate <laughs> about yeah. their menstrual cycles. When Love they it. start to learn about it, they start to say things like, Oh my gosh, thank you. Because now I feel like I can give my body permission to rest on the day that I have low energy, right. Or to yep. push hard on the days that I have higher energy or, um, I hear it often. I, a lot of times I advocate for women that, you know, if you're the type of person who, um, does, isn't affected by painful periods, if you don't have issues in those first couple of days of bleed, it's okay to exercise. But if not, I know a lot of women who just would be better served to rest, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's too much. And a lot of women that are coming to me for hormone imbalance issues, especially whether it's estrogen dominance, endometriosis, painful periods, right? it's better to rest, like listen yeah. to your body. Right. And so when women say to me, like, oh, I used to follow like a set calendar, right? Like I'm a home workout person. That's, that's kind of how my yeah. background began. And so for women who come to me and they say, well, I follow a calendar. It's like, well, that's great. But that calendar was most likely designed for a man and not for your body. So if yeah. you started your period today and your energy's low and you have a headache and you're cramping girl, it is not going to serve you to go push around some weights. You know what I mean? So Sometimes it's really, it's really just giving women permission to listen to their body and to understand what it's communicating to them so that they can, they can pay attention to that. Yeah. So much. I am with you. I, I love the idea of following a calendar calendar because it helps me be accountable and kind of leads my brain like, okay, I know what I'm doing for my workout in the morning, but I've also taken to, uh, creating my own calendar <laughs> based on my cycle. I'm like, okay and putting a couple options on the calendar. So I can say, okay, I'm using the calendar to my advantage, but this is a personalized calendar that accounts for my travel days, that accounts for uh, my cycle phases. And it's it, there's nowhere in this is perfection, right? Like I might have planned a yoga day and I wake up with like all the energy and decide to switch it up or vice versa. But it's just kind of nice and empowering to say like, even a calendar. Like I don't have to follow someone else's calendar. Let me make it myself. Yeah. I find that a lot of women understand one aspect of their menstrual cycle, which is their period, right? Most women can tell you about when their last period happened. They can tell you about their periods, whether they tend to be heavy or painful or, or all those things. Um, but they don't understand the other, you know, 27 plus days, uh, of, of their cycle. And so what I like to really advocate, and I want to make sure I link this up in the show notes. I'm a huge fan of Dr. Lara Bryden. Um, she has a book called period repair manual. She also has one for perimenopause and menopause called hormone repair manual. I will link those up for you guys. But, um, in there, she talks about really, yes, you look at your period and you sort of reverse engineer and you say like, well, what's happening with that? Like, where could there be some issues, right? That that's stemming from maybe painful periods or whatever. Um, but also she talks about ovulation being the fifth vital sign, right? And mm -hmm. for women to really understand what is ovulation, 
most women don't even understand. They think they're fertile all month long, right? You're really only fertile yeah. for like a two to three day window, right? So um, understanding ovulation really is what I want women to understand. Like that's more important almost than your period because it's indicating, are you having healthy menstrual cycles? Is your body able to ovulate? I know for me personally, without going into a rabbit hole, without going into a rabbit hole of, of my story, you know, I, we had infertile years in my twenties where we had just sort of unexplained infertility. I now know what I know because of nerding out on hormone health, that my body wasn't ovulating regularly. Right. And so I was relying on urine test strips that weren't accurate for me of, you know, at that time of my life. And it wasn't working for me because I wasn't ovulating. Right. So for women to understand ovulation, like if you're, if you're listening to this and you're like, where do I start when it comes to cycle syncing, understanding ovulation for you, is it happening? When is it happening? Um, charting, whether that's through charting, basal body temperature, looking at saliva patterns, right? These are all things yeah. that I talk about on the podcast. These are, these are all important things for you to understand because then you'll be able to say, okay, this is sort of my halfway point, quote unquote, of my cycle. So this after ovulation is my luteal phase. That's when I can cater my productivity, my relationships and my, my exercise in a different way. And before that point is my follicular phase where I can cater my exercise, my nutrition and my relationships in a different way. Right. And so yep. starting there, like you said, dividing it into two halves is a great way to start. And yep. then of course you can dive deeper and deeper and deeper, um, as it goes. <laughs> but I think just yeah. you know, for today's purposes, I think we've really helped women understand number one, they deserve to be listened to. If they're, if their check engine lights are flashing and their energy is off, they need to pay attention to that. They have permission to listen to their body and to really give it what it needs. I made some notes for myself when we were kind of coming back to that bowling pin analogy. Um, I wrote down something that you said early on, right? Which is most women need more quiet time. Um, it's been said here on the podcast before dawdling, right? We need more mm. margin. We need more space yeah. because we really are. We really are a lot of times like the cornerstone of our families and of our, Absolutely. you know, every, everything that we're involved in. So I always like to say you, you can't pour from an empty cup. So understanding your body, understanding any sort of root causes that are going on for you, working with somebody like Dr. Page, who can really sit and spend time with you and help you get to the bottom of things and, and change lifestyle um, is key. So as we wrap up today, I would love for you to share with people where they can find you, um, website, et cetera. We'll link all of, it up, all of it up in the show notes, of course, so people can, can swipe up. But uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, please share. Oh, awesome. This has been so fun. So yeah, I would love to connect with you. We have a free um, social online community that is separate from social, I should say, that we love playing in. It's called signaturehealthclub.com. And so that's totally free. We share resources and just have those like in-depth girly conversations that we love off social. And then of course, you can catch me on Instagram at signaturepromarycare.wellness. And yeah, reach out to me and ask me, ask me questions. I love having these conversations. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure this won't be the last time that we talk. It's been great getting to know you and everything that you do. I wish there were more people out there in the world like you who could serve people exactly where they are and with what they need. So uh, without further ado, friends, thank you so much for tuning in today. We'll talk soon.